I'd like to ca call the council back to order. And we will continue with item number 56 to consider a report from the Ordinance Committee regarding allocation of sewer capacity. Re uh, Councilor Jordan. I guess the most you can say about committee is a busy one in the town. The uh, allocation of sewer gallons is what we uh, are adding to the ordinance because in the past it's been in a report from the Fuller Water District, the design flow of the southern sewer. And what we're doing is just adding it to the ordinance and this is how it reads and we change the commercial design allowance established for the construction of the spring treatment plant facility specifically and we cross out commercial design. So schools get 40,000 gallons per day. Other public buildings get 2,000 gallons a day. Commercial including nursing home and country care facilities get 30,000 gallons a day. And the one that down, down found me, infiltration gets 283,000 gallons a day, which is more than all the allocations that we have above. And uh, maybe there's something wrong with the facilities. I don't know, we have just got going on. And we added a paragraph down at the bottom here. As of lodge connecting to the public sewer served by the South Poland Treatment Facility, the planning board shall not approve any such connection unless it has received from the engineer documentation that the proposed increase in flow is within the contract for capacity for the city of South Poland for utilizing utilization of the South Poland treatment facilities. I believe that is the only change that we have. These are reserve capacities, right? Excuse me? All those gallons are reserve capacities, right? Yes. And we are to uh, set this set for a public hearing. On what day? You want to make a motion? I'll make a motion. We set this to a public hearing on April the 11th, 1981, at 7 p.m. 88. Excuse me, 88. <laughs> Is there a second? A second. Any discussion? Uh, Councilor Latore. Just, just out of uh, thinking about it here, when we have nursing homes and congregate care facilities are singled out under commercial, is there a particular reason that those are singled out under commercial? And were those always singled out in all the plans as they came through? Mike? I believe it was put in there because uh, of the nursing home and uh, congregate uh, housing that is before the planning board. No, that isn't? No. The, it, it, it was put in there to clarify it, but it, in the 1985 report that Councilor Jordan has there that's referenced, under commercial, there was a little, in the amount, there was a little asterisk. And if you look down below, the asterisk said that there was capacity set aside for nursing homes, housing for the elderly, I'm not sure what the term was, on two properties on Scott Dyer Road. So it, 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 this is merely continuing what what was done in 1985 when the facility plan was adopted. But if it said nursing homes, how did how all of a sudden does it now say nursing homes and congregate care facilities? How did that grow into the definition? Uh, what, you know, that that's one thing I'm curious about, and why these two particular versus others were maybe it's not clear as to their definition of commercial aren't. Because there must be other nebulous businesses that we're not sure that wouldn't there be a long list of them? Why should why should those two be singled out? Because and given preferential treatment almost. I think the reason is because in 1985 they were excuse me, nursing homes, <coughs> and the ordinance committee merely felt that they ought not to monkey with it now and just continue it along. Okay, because I don't even know whether we have approval of congregate care facilities in town or if you know. If we have even ordinances or things set up, that's something that's going to be looked at, I, I think, right? You do, because the zoning board has ruled that a concrete care facility currently falls under multiplex. And if one came in an actual proposal, it'd be reviewed under the ordinances relating to multiplex uh, 
residential units. Okay. Before it said a nursing home and uh, housing for the elderly, didn't it? Yeah, you have it right there. Uh, I'm trying to find it here right quick, but I think it said housing for the elderly and nursing home. It's on yeah. that big sheet with all the numbers. That one there. Nursing yeah, home. Nursing home. Yeah. So it's estimated 8,000 gallons a day for nursing home and then shopping center, service stations, and proposed nursing home or congregate care facilities. So, okay. Any further discussion? We do have a motion. Yes, I made the motion. Okay. All those in favor of the motion? Opposed? It's unanimous. Damn it. <laughs> Item number 57, to consider a request from the Conservation Commission regarding Willow Brook Dam. Michael? Dr. Rand and I had a conversation about this a week ago tonight about a continuing problem that we've had uh, in continuing concern of the Conservation Commission on the loss of a pond that I'm calling Willow Brook Pond, there's probably another name for it that those who've lived here longer than I know what it is. But back in that terrible November of 1983 when it rained and rained and rained, one of the things that happened was that the sewer pipe uh, that runs across uh, near the outlet of Willow Brook uh, gave way. It was temporarily stabilized due to uh, some tremendous efforts of the Department of Public Works uh, working with the town engineer. But unfortunately, what happened as a result of that was this beautiful pond that had been there uh, was drained uh, and it has not been seen since. Uh, Dr. Rand has brought it to the previous town manager's attention and my attention on a number of occasions. Uh, finally, we were discussing it last Monday and I, I said to Dr. Rand, well, we've got to get this issue uh, moving again after. And the way to do it was to him to write me a, a somewhat nasty letter uh, that would get the issue before the council. Uh, Dr. Rand and uh, very much in kindness sent a, a very uh, nice letter uh, reminding me of uh, the discussions that had occurred, sharing some correspondence. He also worked uh, on the issue with Ned Clifford, who's the president of the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust, who ironically is now the uh, owner of the property uh, due to some conveyances that have taken place over the years. And, uh, you know, it seems to me, you know, if the town, you know, since it was its pipe that caused uh, the, the problem uh, uh, may have an obligation, although that's the judgment of the council, to restore the pond that was once there. Uh, according to uh, Nat Clifford's estimates, uh, it would take a little over $5,000 to do that. Uh, what I'd like you to do is to uh, uh, allocate up to possibly $7,000 uh, to, ha to have the work done as well as to have a proper study done. I have some concern that if we restore the pond, uh, I want to be absolutely positive that it not cause flooding uh, upward of the spot where, where, the new, where a new dam would go uh, or a replacement dam of the early one. In, in years past, there was, there was some flooding, particularly up on the Murray property on Patricia Drive. There was a culvert changed on Scott Dye Road, which seemed to uh, alleviate that. We just want to be sure that if this action is taken, that uh, there isn't a problem uh, up on their property or elsewhere. The funds would come from the sewer capital expansion project, uh, which had a surplus left of approximately uh, $175,000. And I'm asking for an allocation is to sort of, this would be the last gasp of the sewer project uh, to uh, of $7,000 of those funds to uh, resolve this uh, environmental uh, concern of, of the Conservation Commission. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I see Dr. Rand in the audience. Do you have a few words to say? Just a few words to uh, bring council up to uh, speed exactly where this is and what this particular project means to the Conservation Commission because it's been a long standing one. Uh, Dr. Rand, if you could yep. talk into the microphone a little bit. The uh, pond in question is right here at the foot of Willow Brook, which starts up uh, behind Billy Jordan's house and comes down 
entering into the Spring Week Marsh behind the Viking Nursing Home, which is on Scott Dyer Road right there. Uh, the, uh, when the commission first began its business back in the, in the early 70s, why, uh, it was quickly seen that this was one of the areas of town that should be high on its priorities of conservation in town because not only of the pond, which is quite beautiful, but also an oak grove that is right at the foot of the pond. Uh, and there's some more or less open fields on both sides. The, uh, the pond actually sits, uh, uh, lies across a uh, uh, pathway that goes from the high school uh, over to Starboard Drive. Uh, and it also has, coming in from Scott Dyer Road, a conservation easement for a pedestrian way uh, that we obtained from Viking when Viking went in. We've had previous discussions with Mr. Brown, Earl Brown, the owner of this property right next door. And uh, early on, when he was going to put a housing for the elderly there, he had talked with, with, the, with the commission, indicating that he would be willing to give us a conservation easement along the southerly border of his land and also along this pond, which would enhance the beauty of his elderly housing uh, development. Subsequently to that, uh, his idea has now been replaced by another congregate care facility plan by First Atlantic uh, Corporation. And uh, Nat and I have had discussions with them, and they too have indicated a willingness to give us cons to give conservation easements, uh, which would uh, allow pedestrian access from the high school area across the pond up to Night Viking Nursing Home on both sides. So, uh, uh, this has always been a high priority with us, but unfortunately the dam did wash out and in replacement, two major culverts were placed under it which permanently drained the pond. I don't know when the pond was originally built. I asked uh, Bill Jordan tonight and he said eight, uh, 1950 was the last time it may have been replaced, but there was indication it may have been there before. Yes, I, <coughs> the dam was there before, but there was an earth dam and I think in the early 50s, Stan Jordan, uh, put in the cement dam, which was lost in that storm there because it wasn't properly maintained, but it was used back then for an irrigation pond at the time. And the pond does have uh, importance for, for wildlife because there are, it uh, did indeed, uh, was the home for uh, a lot of ducks and other uh, relatively uh, uh, <coughs> deep water species, turtles and frogs and so forth. Uh, now, the next thing that happened that was uh, advantageous to this whole situation was that uh, Mr. Balfour, at the end of the last year, donated to the land trust a parcel of land in this area. And it turned out when he went down to, to uh, pace off the land that he had contributed to the land trust, it indeed incorporated the entire dam. So the dam now is, in the, is now owned by the land trust. Another thing that you should be aware of is that at the time we discussed this last with Michael and with the commission, uh, I was asked to see what the sentiments were of the landowners uh, on either side, that is Viking and uh, Nursing Home and uh, Mr. Brown relative to replacing the pond and both of them, and I have letters to, the, to that effect, both of them would be pleased to see it replaced. Uh, at this time, perhaps we might have Nat come up and tell you the details of the dam. At your pleasure. Mr. Clifford. Thank you. I uh, picked up a copy of the um, water district's map of uh, or plan of the sewer as it goes through there, and that's probably the best reference for uh, looking at the dam replacement. What uh, I think would work the best is to take a um, uh, piece of uh, concrete dam straight across in front of the two culvert pipes that are there. I, the scale of this is such that I'm sure I'd have to pass it down. Uh, through the council if you want to look at it, but uh, leave everything that's uh, presently there as it is, the berm and the, and the uh, culvert pipes going through it, which presently drain the brook at the lower level, and simply, as I say, put a concrete dam across uh, upstream from the pipes and uh, bring the level up about three feet over the pipe, so that uh, the two culverts are, are three feet high and four feet wide which would mean that right at the um, uh, culverts in back of the dam, you'd have approximately six feet of water. Actually, as the pond goes back, it, it, uh, the elevation comes up some, so it wouldn't be nearly 
that depth um, further back towards the Viking. I have the an enlargement of the uh, USGS map showing the old pond, which is pretty much in the configuration that shows on the town wetland map. And I think in uh, bringing the level up, as I suggested, you'll, you'll recreate approximately that uh, same configuration. I have a board here with some photographs also if the council uh, would want to take a look at it that, that shows the pond in its present condition. I think from the watermark along the bank, you can pretty much see where the old pond went. Um, in my letter to Michael, I indicated a, an approximate cost for the dam based on the amount of concrete and a minor amount of excavating and, and uh, gravel fill underneath where the dam would go, and give or take a, a small percentage. I think I'm probably a little bit on the high side with, with my estimate, which came out uh, slightly over $5,000. I think for the protection of the town, it probably would make sense to have uh, uh, the town engineer go out and just shoot some grades to make sure that the elevations that, that I'm suggesting that we did uh, rather crudely would uh, result in, in pretty much a restoration of the pond as it used to be. If the issue of uh, any permits uh, occurs to anyone on the council, um, I recently on another project have had occasion to get a legal opinion uh, on this type of thing where, where a, um, an obstruction is being placed in a brook even though in this case it's, it's an obstruction that previously was there. The uh, way the main uh, um, planning and land use laws uh, reads the exception, um, it accepts any project and specifically mentions dams uh, crossing a stream, and this, uh, the references are both for dams and pipelines, that don't disturb more than 100 feet of stream bank on either side. In this case, the total width of the dam is, is uh, about 40 feet, including a straight section and then two wings coming back into the berm. As I say, in another context, I had occasion to have a legal opinion on uh, the application of that e exception. I think it would apply here and again. I think uh, giving the, uh, given the town attorney's uh, opinion, which should be easily rendered, uh, he should support that. Um, other than to answer any questions on the, on the design or whatever, uh, uh, that's about all I had. Now, did you say you had some pictures? Yeah. Because there are some of us, at least, who uh, are not familiar with this These font. are, uh, I can leave this with you to, to uh, pass around just uh, so you can see the Viking uh, is shown here with a, with a green shaded area around in Scott Dyer Road. The brook running down through and the present berm is, is right at the top of the sketch. Each photograph is numbered and then if you pick the number from the plan it will give you a direction the photograph is taken in. But it, it pretty much shows the extent of the original pond. And as I say, you can see the mark around the edge of it, so I can leave this with you. Will you, will you leave it in the town hall? Certainly. And we can come in and look at it at our leisure? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, questions? Uh, we'll start from the far left. I have no questions, just statements. Okay. Councilor Jordan. I have strong feelings that we should re replace this dam. Uh, uh, the town, actually, in my my view, uh, it, it is the body that destroyed it. Uh, I think we should approve that amount of money, $7,000, for this project, only I don't like where it's coming from. I'd rather take it out of the the, the general funds and leave the 7,000 from the sewer fund surplus along with the rest of the surplus in the sewer fund and give it back to the people that have to pay a sewer fee to help them out. I, I think the sewer fund surplus should go back to, to alleviate some of those high user fees. That's all I have to say. Councilor Amaro. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Clifford. Uh, you said that the dam, or the spot where the dam uh, would go, is now owned by the Cables of Land Trust. That's correct. Could you tell me exactly what the relationship is between the Cables of Land Trust and the town of Cables? 
The Cape Elizabeth Land Trust is a private, nonprofit, publicly supported organization dedicated to preserving open space in Cape Elizabeth. And as such, really has no legal tie to the town. It's a completely separate private entity. Okay, if the town pays to replace this dam, whose responsibility would it then be to, for the upkeep of this dam? Michael? Yeah, uh, you know, within this, I think we, we would need to work on an arrangement with the land trust uh, for it. The town has concern that, you know, we, we want to have con some control over it because all our pipes go right through there. It's within an, an easement area of either the town or the water district. Uh, my sense is, uh, you know, we would have a letter of understanding with the land trust that it would be a town responsibility. And a follow-up question is who sets the water level regime? I think uh, the, the measurements that I took, uh, uh, obviously quite informally over the last week, uh, I'd like to see verified for, uh, I think, everyone's protection by the town engineer. That's why I appreciate Mike uh, uh, putting a s small amount in the budget to do that. Uh, I think it's a very simple exercise. So to you're saying that the town would control the water level? I think, I think that's reasonable, yes, yeah, since the impact goes far beyond uh, land owned by the land trust. And I think, as, as Peter's mentioned, the uh, budding property owners uh, are in favor, so that uh, I, I think uh, the problem is somewhat mitigated, but yes. They wouldn't be in favor if they got flooded. Certainly not. Jay, I'm sorry, did you have anything else? To answer your question, uh, um, I can't speak for my directors, but I certainly think that, that uh, any um, uh, letter of understanding certainly uh, should be forthcoming from the land trust with respect to uh, management of the dam. I'm certain that uh, that can be worked out. Okay, thank you. Councilor Tinsman. Well, I've just got a, a number of questions, not a real well, big number of questions, but a, a few questions that I'd like to have answered tonight before I vote for any uh, expenditures of money. The first question is, you know, I, I think I know where this site is, but I'm really not totally familiar with this, where this dam is going to be going. And I do know that the council will probably plan through its budget chairman a tour of the facilities this year like we usually do, or at least the last few years have. And I would hope that this be scheduled for us so at least I can become familiar uh, before I leave. <clears throat> and then my second question is, do we have a legal right to use sewer construction monies for something that may not be totally related to the expanded sewer? And I'd be concerned for, for two reasons. First of all, that money should be returned to the users if, if we don't have the legal right, but also where does it stop? You know, if there's any minutely related sewer project that needs to be updated, you know, where do we end that expenditure? Will the pond hold water now that we've got columns going through? I, I, I'm assured somewhat that it will, but I don't even know where this pond is. And I probably should be out with my snowshoes or whatever looking at it on my own. But I think the council needs to find out in their own mind if the pond will hold water how do we get to the culverts that we've installed? Are we going to disrupt it again if we do go in there? Or what if we need to put more culverts down through that same area? Are we going to disrupt the pond or the, the dam in, in future times? Who's going to be liable for maintaining the dam? Who's going to be liable for kids falling in the pond? Who's going to be liable for all the things that go with with having a substantial, I would assume it's a fairly large pond if it gets dammed up again. I'm only assuming that. I, I will take a look at your pictures, but it looks like from the pictures I've seen, or at least maps, that it's going to be a, a good sized pond. Is it a great pond? Mm -hmm. well, no, acres? not. No. no, is it 10 acres? No. 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 But I mean, How many acres? There's a scale on that uh, plan you have. Uh, I believe it's 60 feet to the inch, and, and um, 
tell you a wild guess, I'd say the pond isn't more than uh, a couple of hundred feet long and probably a hundred feet wide or so. Okay, I mean, it's, it's bigger than a puddle mm. and smaller than a pond. Yeah. Bigger than a bread box. <laughs> but it's still something that the town, because you're creating it, is going to have a certain liability towards this, whether we own it or not. And uh, of the $7,000 that you're asking for tonight, I mean, you were talking about a $17,000 project. That was the type of seven. Did that, did that shorten yeah. your list of questions? Well, that <laughs> answered that question. But, uh, those are some of the questions I'd like to have answered before I appropriate. Michael? Yeah, just to answer, I, I think I got most of your questions. Uh, whether or not it's legal to take it out of the sewer fund, the sewer fund, the, the sewer capital expansion fund, the sewer capital expansion fund was, was set up to take care of the Southern Cape Elizabeth Sewer Project. Uh, the portion of that project was to replace the pipe that was that was involved here uh, with a problem that was destabilized that caused the problem with the culverts. Uh, the Conservation Commission approached the town, as a, there's a letter that you received, uh, I think it was back in 1985, uh, to try to have the town involved in the sewer project. At that point, I said no that I didn't want to get involved with alterations of wetlands and we didn't own the property at the time and there were all sorts of other questions. I, you know, to me it's, it's sewer related, it was related to the sewer project, it was within the work area, it's within a sewer easement. Uh, seems fairly clear that it's, to me, that you could decide to take it out of that fund if you wish, of course, you, you could send it elsewhere. As the question, when does the sewer fund end, you know, are we going to keep dipping into this forever and ever? Uh, it is my intent that the sewer capital expansion fund uh, will become part of the regular sewer fund surplus as of the close of this fiscal year. Uh, if this project is not done by then, which chances are it would not be, that small amount would be set aside. Otherwise, that fund would lapse and we, there would no longer be a capital expansion fund. Who is liable? Uh, you know, the town would be liable, but it's it's also something that we're protected under under the Maine Tort Claims Act. So, you know, we we would we would have the liability, but I'm not sh too sure how much liability that would be. You know, we have other ponds in the community, Lions Field, Fort Williams, and others, and uh, it's a liability we have to we have to deal with. Uh, those were your questions. Just a minute. Are there any questions down this Yes. Well, oh, yes, yes, okay. yes, 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 yes. I want to say from the outset I'm in favor of this project and I tried to get the previous manager to fix it when it washed out and they repaired the pipe. I'm no engineer but I'm concerned and had a little experience in what you're up to, uh, Nat, uh, <clears throat> in putting, in putting the, uh, concrete in front of the culverts and what have you. I take it the dam's going to be high in the culverts so the water has to come in and drop down in. Is that is that correct? Okay. Are you going to have uh, any planks in there so you can raise and lower the water in the cement area or are you going to keep it at one level? I would suggest as a layman, and I again would want this uh, um, borne out with a town engineer, but I'd suggest setting the, the um, elevation of the dam and leaving it, then it reduces the maintenance problem of, of uh, adding and removing splashboards. A quick calculation uh, uh, a week ago when we were out looking at it would indicate that the culverts have a certain cross-section uh, area which, which tells you how much water they can take through. If you can reproduce that same cross-section from the top of the spillway part of the dam to the overflow uh, point that's in the berm down there, which is a, is a riprap section uh, intended for that purpose, then you're exactly duplicating with the, with the dam itself the amount of capacity that the culverts have. And I don't see at that point any need to have an adjustable spillway. I don't think the, uh, uh, there's anything to be gained by it. Well, the adjustable spillways is 
use quite often that you raise it in the summer and lower it in the winter mm -hmm. for ice and spring floods. But you have a spillway, and I believe the spillway is still there that you're going to maintain in case something happens to the culverts and they block up and it's not going to be able to back up. You will have that spillway on the side. By putting the dam uh, on the upstream side of the culverts and a slight distance away from them, you really aren't getting involved in the, the uh, uh, action of the culverts or anything to do with the berm, so they, they remain really two separate elements. Okay, but the spillway will still be there. That's correct. Yeah, oh, the Out old, beyond oh, the, the dam. Flow, yes. Yeah. My other question is, uh, my other point is, I'm concerned as far as the money coming, as the same two previous speakers have spoken, coming from the sewer fund, I think that should stay there. I think that that should come out of town funds as far as repairing this dam. And the other thing that bothers me is the ownership part of it. Now, I would like to have a discussion someday on where the line is drawn between the land trust and the town and the town spending the money. And I have no problems with land trust, or, and I think they've done a great job in picking up different parcels around the Cape. But I think it's a separate organization, and the, then they come and want the town to put the bill to do different things. And I think the town should own the land if they're going to be responsible for it. Michael? Yeah, I, I would like to clarify that the land trust did not come to the town in this instance uh, asking for the money. It, it's been a long-standing concern. I think the land trust is kind of caught in the middle of it and at this point is the land owner. The other point I'd like to make is I've heard a couple questions about the relationship between the, the land trust and the town itself. Uh, Nat, Peter, myself, and others have been having continuing discussions uh, on that issue. Uh, I've asked the town attorney to draft an opinion on the current relationship between the land trust and the town in, in relation to joint membership on the different boards. Uh, we're going to be having a meeting sometime soon of uh, Mr. Clifford, Dr. Rand, Charles Barnes, who is the attorney. Uh, for the land trust, uh, Tom Leahy, the attorney for the town, and myself to review a draft letter uh, that the town attorney is now preparing, which, which outlines his views of that relationship. Uh, we'll have some discussion, and there will be an opinion coming to the council uh, at some point in the near future on that issue. I have one more question. When do you plan to do this project? I think. Uh, in terms of the seasonal aspects, uh, the best time to do it would be probably late August, uh, sometime before fall, try to catch the uh, water at its lowest point. The flow isn't that great down there, as you can see from the photographs, but it, I think it would uh, certainly reduce the uh, maintenance cost during construction to try to catch the... So lowest. other than getting the engineering done in advance, uh, this could almost be a budget item in next year's budget, if it's August. That would be the way I would head in that direction. Certainly the engineering shouldn't take uh, very long and, and the construction time, I would think, uh, probably a couple of weeks would uh, start to finish uh, more than do it. Okay, that's it. I guess seeing that this pond has not been in existence since 1983, I don't see any great emergency to have to allocate the funds tonight. And I think enough questions have been raised that it ought to go through the regular budgetary process to see which, uh, if indeed we do this, uh, how it should be funded. And it would also, if, if we do it during the regular budget uh, season, give us a chance to go and look at the site and uh, maybe have some about questions. I guess I would be in favor of tabling it, but I don't want to make that motion until I have a chance. Okay. Okay. Uh, Councilor Jordan. <coughs> yeah, my only other question is, uh, after listening to the manager speak, uh, I just would like to ask him this question. Uh, you don't have any intentions of giving that $175,000 surplus back 
to help the sewer users? Okay, are you intending to put that, when you do away with it, are you just intending to put that in the general budget or what? I'm intending to put it in the general budget to avoid a sewer rate increase. The Portland Water District assessment was budgeted for this fiscal year at approximately $100,000 uh, less than it actually came out at. Those funds will be very much needed in order to avert a sewer rate increase in the coming year. shall be dissolved 60 days after submittal of its final report. Uh, I take it that that report, Michael, uh, no later than September 1, 1988, would be the final report that is referred to in the last Yes, ma'am. So, uh, Michael, that's the uh, gist of the Thomas Jordan Trust Study Committee. Do I have any reaction from the council? Council of the tour. Yes, I'm wondering, our, our poor, we, what is our fund called again? Is, is it a poor farm fund or? There's really to, no such fund. To aid the poor. I mean, you know, for instance, when uh, Mr. Maxwell rented the land, where did that rental go? It went into an account labeled poor farm proceeds, mm -hmm. but there's never been any policy set as to uh, formally establishing that fund. Uh, and setting forth the uses uh, of the fund. Well, the gist of my question is, are there any other sources of income other than the uh, Thomas Jordan property that we, that we may be putting into this a particular fund that we may create? 
because I didn't want to limit it just to that property if there's other sources of income. We want to look at the whole broad picture, I guess. What do we do with our monies to help the poor? Whereas this seems to limit the scope specifically to money generated by that property. Uh, point four is that Chairman Masterton read uh, attempts to bring out that issue. So we will examine the entire question of should other funding sources come into what we call poor poor farm fund, we will also, this, com this committee will look into how to expend those funds as well. Uh, may, may I speak to, to that number four? Uh, as you know, concerns have been expressed about the fact that uh, elderly people who have lived in the Cape all their lives may come to the point where they can no longer afford the taxes as our property uh, values increase. And um, those concerns have been expressed by various members of the council. Uh, we thought that we could tie in the look-see at the poor farm proceeds um, with a general examination of uh, the state circuit breaker, for example, and how that might help uh, <coughs> elderly uh, taxpayers and other uh, any other programs, uh, sewer bill relief that that we might offer. So there is a narrow scope to this uh, uh, committee, but there's also a much broader one, and and. The broad purpose is to look at some sort of relief for pe persons, <coughs> poor people, or persons on fixed income okay. that just can't keep up. Okay, so there'll be there'll be a broader scope. It sounds like, and just that's fine. Thank you, Councilor uh, Yes, I ju just have a question on the uh, time frame. Uh, you're asking for seven members to be appointed to this committee. Uh, that will need to be advertised. People need to be interviewed. It will, uh, the appointments will have to be approved by the council. And so we're talking about this committee not really getting going until mid to late April. And I'm wondering if we're giving them enough time uh, to carry out their duties. It's just a question. I, I, we're asking them to work hard during the summer months. And I don't know if we might want to extend that date a little bit. Uh, may I ask you, Michael, you, you chose that date and we didn't discuss it. Did you have any reason for it? No, the you only didn't want it a long term, yeah. year long. Yeah, the only reason was this was written about March 1st and September 1st was six months thereafter. Uh, any date's fine. I, I don't think it needs to take a whole year. That's um, whatever date you want. What would you suggest, Councilor Amaro? Uh, I'd say October 15th, maybe uh, November 1st. I give them enough time to, so uh, they don't have to schedule everything in the summer. Six months after appointed. Yeah, or six months after. Yeah, months after. Yeah, months after. How about December 1st? December 12th. <laughs> it's hard to get people together, collected to meet, and learn the project in the summertime. I think so. It's not that things stop in the summer, but it is hard to organize. So there'll be people missing from meetings at that time. Maybe we go to December 1st. It's fine. Councilor Jordan. Yes, I just would like to move that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council does hereby approve the establishment of the Thomas Jordan Trust Study Committee as presented. With but now amendment, with the amendment that you just made. Okay. Big button. Do you want to uh, incorporate the amendment that uh, Councilor Amaroff Yes. Yes. The December 1 uh, Is there a second from another joint? Second. Oh. From another one? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, I withdraw my second. <laughs> it's the most to second uh, to uh, go ahead with uh, this Thomas Jordan Trust Study uh, Committee with the one amendment changing the September 1 date to December 1, 1988. Councilor Jordan. <clears throat> the other Jordan's in opposition to this study deal. My, my reasons are, number one, I think the committee's too big. I don't think you need seven members to do uh, a study like this. And uh, 
the more you put on it, the, the attendance is going to be harder to get them together and harder for them to work. And uh, <clears throat> I just see the, uh, a job of this side that it's a little too long. And number two, I see the 99% of this project as legal for attorneys to review and to come up with the answer. And I can't understand why we need seven other people to review what attorney is going to come and tell them what to do. And I don't know unless you're going to put attorneys on them and let them do it for free, I'll be in favor. But I don't think you're going to do it because they have to eat too, they tell me. So uh, I am going to vote against this. And number two, it was an article in the paper and it brought to my attention, and I didn't read it that way, that the, the marsh was all left to the Thomas Jordan will. And that isn't so. They only own a portion of the marsh that goes with the property of the poor farm. I, can, I concur with what uh, Councilor Jordan has made for statements regarding the legality of the review. And I think that the town attorney or an attorney with an expertise in, in wills or if, if there is such a thing, and I'm sure there is, I mean, I'm sure there is, that perhaps someone should be able to review the, the strong parts of this committee assignment which are legal interpretations. I do think it's important, however, to have a group of people, lay people, discuss what we should do for, for uh, the benefit of the poor in Cape Elizabeth, be it unemployed poor, young families or individuals, or be it elderly on fixed income. And I think for the people on this board to concentrate on item number three and item number four, and then I would think a, a catch-all, any other duties as prescribed by the town council might be appropriate, uh, unless that's just a technicality. But to, to strike one and two, or to have one and two just be delegated to an attorney uh, may require some costs. And uh, if we anticipate these costs now, I'd like to know about it, or if we just plan to uh, uh, have this committee come up with the answers. Uh, I'd be more comfortable in voting for or against this. I, I'd like to say that presently we don't have any policy on what to do with any proceeds that <coughs> we uh, that we uh, realize from the property, and we have rented out the land for agricultural purposes. And I don't remember how much we realized from that. It wasn't all that much, but uh, there may be other uses in the future that may reap some profit, and since the, the deed says that the proceeds should be used for the benefit of the poor, it seems to me very important that, that the town set a policy, and that's the narrow scope. Sure, I agree. I think three and four is essential. I think one and two should not be left for committee of seven people. That's a legal thing. Three and four, I highly recommend that the committee study. Well, I think that, uh, well, I don't want to debate this with you, but I think that the purpose of one and two is to set the stage for the policy making. That is the legal aspect. Well, well, I, I guess a footing, a base for... The reason that. for my even asking is we're going to require a legal opinion. Is that legal opinion going to cost money? If it's going to cost money, we should appropriate it now or rather than just set up a committee without any funds. Yeah, uh, it will cost some money. There was some, there was quite a bit of previous work that was done by the prior town attorney on this issue that's available. It was also quite a bit of work done by the current town attorney when the Gullcrest Farm issue was being uh, debated. Uh, I don't know the exact amount my feeling was we would absorb this into the regular legal account of the town. Uh, I think number two, the other issue that comes in there is to review the obligations of the town. A, a lawyer comes out with an opinion, particularly out of a current town attorney. He always doesn't set his foot in concrete, and he likes to bounce some of his, his ideas around. Uh, 
you know, reviewing the obligations, uh, there's a doctrine that I did get some free legal advice from another attorney uh, that's called side prey, which means close to the original. And if, if you take that, and it's what's used in probate, if you take that doctrine of side prey, it, it, it's, it's not necessarily a, a black and white issue what the obligations are. So it's something that, that does have policy implications and that citizens might like to, uh, and the council might like to get their teeth into. When we were discussing the Gullcrest Farm issue, we were wondering whether or not it was adequate and right for the town to do certain things with land belonging to the poor of the town. And part of that process to determine exactly whether it was right or not, regardless of a legal opinion, was to put it through the court system. And at that point in time, we were told that if it needed to go through the court system, to go through court to get a proper ruling, that it would be at the cost of the developers. Okay, there's some question whether or not the Gullcrest Farm situation may follow through with its acquisition. If we are going to try to determine a policy and don't have the benefit of what I think we would have had with that court decision, if it had gone that far, then we may have to put this to the court. And I just think that it's important for the council to know if we're going to establish a policy in my layman's opinion, we're going to require some funds because it's going to have to be cleared up through the courts, in my opinion. And just to be aware of this, and, and I'd like to know what the cost might be. Councilor Carson, I'm excited to speak tonight. I haven't spoken oh. about the music to our ear. Absolutely. Well, I concur with Councilor Tinsman and Councilor Jordan that in order to, in order to move this along, we were to appoint seven lay people who have either not on a committee or have not functioned on a board and say, here's the charge. They're going to have to go back and do a lot of work and they're going to ask for staff time. They're going to ask the manager, can you provide us with this and this and this? Why can't we speed the process along? Clearly, number one is, is a legal opinion. You have to get the lawyer. Why can't the lawyer provide that opinion to the committee at its onset instead of having the committee meet, go over all this material and say, gee, we need to have this information and ask staff time to get it. So why can't we just, we know it's going to cost some dollars, we know we're going to have to have a lawyer, why can't we get him to speak, give the options of, uh, on item number two, there are several options that fit within the legal ramifications, uh, maybe, and then let that committee work with that information and proceed ahead. Um, but I don't see how they, it's just sort of slowing it down for two or three meetings to say, to find out what they need, come back to you to say this is what we need, you've got to call up the attorney. Why can't we put the thing in motion with the attorney now? We would, we would do that if you prove this tonight. The, the reason you have number one in there is because that has always been a subject of some debate. The charge, and we and, agree. You know, this, whenever we establish committees, what we also try to do is establish an outline of a final report. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that wherever it comes from, the final report describe the land that's, that's being discussed, and that's the reason that that is in it. I agree, and that, that's certainly a good form, but in, in the essence of time, if we approve this, can't we get the attorney to act on those items? If by the time we get the appointments made, the committee called together, I the charges do. made, we got the information. That would be done if you approve this. Any further discussion? Council of So the cost then of the legal, inherent legal fees here is going to be built into our town attorney's fees that are already in the present, present budget. There's probably somewhat of a contingency because that number itself isn't cast in cement. That's where I'm assuming the money's coming from. Yes, there'll be some cost, but we've budgeted some money for town attorneys, and this is probably going to fall within that. I don't see any tremendous legal expense right now, so, so we have to attach a number to it, so I'm comfortable with passing it as is. Michael, uh, you said that some work uh, has already been done with relation to the road. Press okay. Um, how much of the work has been done, do you think? Some of it, not all of it. Charlie, Charles Barnes also did someone who was a proposal for a psychiatric hospital back in 1979. The, the problem in, you know, getting at the expense of, you know, going to court, when you go to the probate court, you go to them with specific proposals. Can we do this? They respond yes or no. You know, they, they you don't go to them saying, uh, you know, what can we do with this land? You have to give them specific proposals. Uh, so, you know, there is a cost in that, but that's a cost down the line. 
and it would be something the council would have, as the trustee, would have to authorize those questions to be asked to the court. Those, those otherwise would not go, because you are the trustees, mm -hmm. we think. <laughs> Councilor Jordan. My, <clears throat> my opinion is, and the way I look at this, is that we should get one and two answered, and if it's going through the courts, it's going to take some time, and it's all legal work. Then, if we wanted to form a committee to look at three and four, I would be in agreement to it. But to form a committee, and if it goes through the courts and it takes some time, they're not going to do anything all summer because it's going to be tied up there. And I don't think you're going in there and get an answer within two weeks or three weeks or a month. So <clears throat> I still feel very strongly that we shouldn't form this committee at this point. Are you ready for a vote? Could we have the motion? We motive? have, it, yes, we have Councilor Amaro's no, motion, uh, uh, Councilor Lester George's uh, <coughs> motion to adopt what you have before us with right. a an amendment offered by Councilor Amaro to change the deadline, the final report date from September 1 to December 1. That's correct. That's correct. Are you ready for the vote? Well, can I just ask a question? Yeah. One more question. There's been two or three suggestions that we put the first two items in motion with an attorney so that that can be happening prior to the time that this committee is appointed so that it could then at least have some of that information. Is that uh, just a bookkeeping item that will be done? Okay. The manager said that he would okay. that. Are you ready? All those in favor? Opposed? <laughs> well, I listen to you people, and after they listen to me, I just change my mind. Uh, okay. Item 59 to consider establishing an affordable housing study committee. Councilor Amaro. Uh, thank you. This is to establish a committee uh, to work with a similar committee which has been established in the town of Yarmouth to carry out the uh, uh, intention of the grant which we received from the State Housing Authority. Uh, the Yarmouth uh, Council has already acted and has created their committee. Their committee consists of seven people, five members uh, from the chosen from the citizens at large and two members of their town council. I thought it appropriate to suggest that we do the same thing. It's not necessary that we do, but uh, I thought their reasons for setting it up that way made sense. Uh, so we, we are proposing a committee of seven people from Cape Elizabeth. And the charge of this committee, uh, there are six charges. The first one is to review data on housing sale prices in the Cape uh, and throughout the greater Portland area. Secondly, to review current town ordinances that may or may not have an effect on housing affordability in Cape Elizabeth. To coordinate its efforts with the town of Yarmouth Affordable Housing Committee and with the Cape Elizabeth Comprehensive Planning Commission. Uh, four, to determine the extent of a, an affordable housing problem in Cape Elizabeth. Five, to research innovative potential solutions to provide more affordable housing in Cape Elizabeth if the committee determines that we do have an affordable housing problem. And <coughs> six, to prepare a report with the recommendations to be submitted to the town council no later than September 7, 1988. Uh, the appointments committee uh, did consider uh, applicants for this committee, hoping that the council uh, uh, would would agree to the establishment of the uh, Affordable Housing Study Committee. <coughs> so we do have people prepared to serve on the committee and uh, and ready to go. And uh, hopefully that September 7th date would be appropriate. But I'd certainly uh, be willing to consider. Uh, giving them a little more time also for, uh, for the same reasons that we did with the last group. Councilor Navarro, uh, what's the deadline for Yarmouth? I don't know that. I don't know what their deadline is. Do you we should coordinate with them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is their group already working? 
No, no, they've just been appointed. But both committees will be working with a COG uh, consultant uh, to help with the research and setting up the procedures. Madam Chairman, for, for the reasons that mentioned earlier, I think we do have to change that September 7th date because it's simply very difficult to get people together over the summer. For that, for this scope of work, we might look to it December 1st or maybe leave it blank in conjunction with Yarmouth. Or, but, but certainly December, I would think, is more appropriate. Makes sense. We're so I would, move to, I would move to amend it to December 1st. Just a suggestion that you move it to a date other than December so you're not, so your December agenda, it's always a very long one, even though this year the council's not going to be organizational items. You might not want to have both committees doing lengthy reports the same evening. Mm -hmm. How about a future date to coordinate with that with the Army Town Council completion? Yeah, this December won't be very long. You won't have a. It's always long for some reason. Yeah, even be, with the because you have all the appointments and all the new council people. And so well, this year it won't be that way. Yeah. It's going to be short. <laughs> I hold firm on December. Do not have I hold firm on December. <laughs> the amount of ordinance review work that they'll have to do, 1988, is not even appropriate. But it would help. It would be helpful to have a motion before I amend. That That's motion. right. We need a main motion. Well, I'd like to make a motion that uh, we establish a, an affordable housing study committee, as I just outlined. And when would you like its report due? Uh, I'd like to. That's to be able to coordinate the uh, the date with the Yarmouth uh, Affordable Housing Committee and bring that date back to you at the next meeting. Why don't you incorporate incorporate that into your budget? Yeah. Uh, I, I, okay. The Any further report, discussion? Councilman Jordan. Just one question. This this is a committee that's required for our grant. Right. So right. I got to vote in favor of it. Huh? That's right. Any further discussion? All vote. All, all in favor. <laughs> it's unanimous. <laughs> Item 60. To consider a report from the Appointments Committee and take any necessary action. <coughs> Councilor Amaro. Uh, thank you, Madam Appointments Chairman. Appointments Committee Chair. Thank you. Uh, First of all, I want to thank the Appointments Committee, which consists of Penny Carson uh, and Frank Latore and myself. Uh, it was a great committee. We had a lot of fun. We met some really interesting people, and I think we all enjoyed our task thoroughly. Uh, we did uh, interview everyone who applied except those who were already uh, serving on the committee and uh, who were incumbents. Over 40 people did apply to serve on committees this year. Uh, unfortunately, we were not able to place all of them on a committee, but uh, we hope that those people who we were not able to place this year might consider applying again at another time. Uh, I want to compliment the candidates that we did have for their willingness to, to think and to accept uh, a position other than what they had initially applied for. Uh, we had several people who were willing to forego their first, second, and even sometimes their third choices and uh, to take an alternate appointment because they were very anxious to become involved in uh, uh, community activities. Uh, everyone that we talked to really had a great desire to serve the community, and for several different reasons. We had people who had been living in town for a long time who said, it's about time I give something back to this community that has given me so much. We had other people who were new to town who, who said that they would like to get on a committee because they wanted to learn more about the town they wanted to become involved. So uh, I was just thrilled with the desire of so many of these people to, to be willing to serve uh, and thank all of those people who we asked to serve on uh, committees which, which were not their primary choices to thank them for doing it. Once again, I just think that we are so fortunate in this town to have so many interested uh, and interesting people uh, willing to serve on our committee. So at this time, I would like to uh, give you the uh, recommendations of the Appointments Committee for the various positions that we were asked to fill. First of all, for the Area Development Council, George Dunn. Uh, for the Planning Board, 
for a five-year term, Alice Rand, and also for, as a regular member of the planning board to uh, fill out for one year uh, the unexpired term of Jack Orr, who resigned. Uh, we are recommending Marion Guthrie to that position. As the two planning board associates, which are one-year positions, we are recommending Joel Russ and Gregory Cross. Uh, for the zoning board, uh, we have three uh, full-time positions uh, that we had to fill. And for those three positions, we recommend uh, Dr. Bruce Sabat, Peter Rubin, and Lawrence Clough. We also needed to fill two one-year associate positions on the zoning board, and we are recommending Robert Cronin and Nancy Sanger. For the Board of Health, Dr. Julius Damien. Uh, for the Board of Assessment Review, Glenn Black. For the Conservation Commission, William Waldman. For the Riverside Cemetery Trustee, uh, Frank Ferrero. For uh, two uh, trustees, the Thomas Memorial Board, Susan Busby and Janet Hawks. Uh, and the Community Services Advisory Committee, Allison Reed. <coughs> Uh, for the Cable uh, TV Advisory Board, there is one term expiring in uh, 1890, and, and we are recommending John Bates. 19, sorry, thank you. 1990, John Bates uh, to fill that position. And for two three-year positions on the Cable Advisory Board, Sharon Roberts and Myron Reed. Uh, for the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, uh, we had three appointments to make there, and the three recommendations are Ann Kerner, Joan Ralston and Nancy Jackson. On the Board of Historic Preservation, we also had three, uh, three openings there, and we're recommending Jane Jordan, Alan Bernstein, and Nancy Harvey. The Cape Elizabeth Arts Commission, there are two positions there, and our, our recommendations are Teresa Norton and Alan Wicken. For the Board of Sewer Appeals, Ralph Romano III. For the Personnel Appeals Board, George Hackett. Uh, the Affordable Housing Study Committee, uh, the five representatives from the Citizens at Large uh, that we are recommending to you are R. Brad Schwartz, Janet Greenlaw, Kathleen Connor, George Schumann, and Juan Perez Fibre. Did you say I had the other two? I didn't. Yes, the other two. And uh, Councilor John just reminded me that we do need to appoint two people from the council to so serve on the, uh, the Affordable Housing Committee. But this time, I'd like to recommend that uh, these names that I just read uh, be accepted by the town council as the new appointees to our boards and commissions. Second. Any discussion? All those, Councilor Timson. I think that it would be appropriate right now to pick the two members of the council to serve on the Affordable Housing Board so that we don't have to come up with another item <clears throat> either the next meeting or perhaps later time meeting. We could just amend. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, we must know who these two members are going to be. We could do it. No, no you're saying that we, we say there should be two council positions or that we name the names? I think as part of this motion, we should include two councilors to serve on this Affordable Housing Committee. That we do it tonight as part of this motion. Yeah. Councilor Just a suggestion. <coughs> yeah, we we did approve that there be two councilors on this. I wondered if uh, it was possible to to have some councilors serve in the interim if this if this committee gets organized and meets, and then we wait till the, till after the election because there's really only four people to choose from, one of whom was the chairman, leaving three people to choose from who were we're going to stay on the council. And those three people are burdened right now with several board and committee appointments representing the town for the council and, and in the region. And I wondered if there was some way of, of having either no councilors or, or some councilors act as interim until maybe some of the newer members of the council get elected because it's only going to be for two or three meetings and then those, I just think it's a lot for the three remaining councilors to, to take on. But I may be mistaken. Maybe the three million councilors here want to assume that one of those committee positions. I don't. I mean, do you know what I'm saying, Billy? That that for the three of you, yeah, that's your jail. I don't. I got enough to do without. That's what I'm saying. That I'm concerned about that. 
And if we make all of these appointments and fill all of these boards, you'll have three new counselors that won't have any uh, committees such as this, which, that, which are going to meet and then be over in a short period of time. There won't be anything, something may come up, but I think that it would be nice to have something for the new counselors. And I feel bad for the three remaining counselors to take on more responsibility. Are there any present counselors? <laughs> who are going to be around after the May election, uh, who, are, who are interested in serving. I would be I am interested. Are you I'm interested in serving. Oh, well, then there's no problem. The, uh, the only problem with waiting until July would be July, until we... Uh, yeah. And I think any any uh, new councils that are elected uh, who want to come to the committee meetings that cer would certainly be welcome. But I would hate to wait until that time to appoint the council representative. I don't have any problem with that. I really felt the councils were burdened. But if there's two people that want it, fine. Council Latour. Madam Chairman, I would like to nominate Chairman Masterton and Council Amaral to be the two council representatives of the Affordable Housing Committee. I'll okay. second that. <laughs> Uh, all those in favor? Not a vote for myself. <laughs> <laughs> Opposed? Unanimous. Now, um, we should go back to uh, the uh, proposal. Yeah. Is there a motion? Yeah. 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 Okay, all those in favor of the original motion? With the these additions. Yes. Yeah. With the amendment. Uh, item number 11, which was tabled from meeting number two, was that in February? December. December. I move that we take item to number 11. To consider approving the 1988 dog warrant and take any necessary action. Debbie? No. Wait. Uh, Let's bring it from the table. You're going to listen oh. to Lester. Okay. I move that we take item 11 off the table. Second. Second. All those in favor? Unanimous. And Debbie is going to uh, fill us in on the dog warrant. He did finally receive the dog warrant from the state of Maine. I just wanted to explain a little bit what it does. It is posted um, by the dog officer in town. It allows uh, us, as a, acting as a municipal agent for the state, to charge late fees on those uh, dog owners that are delinquent. Uh, dog licenses are due January 1st of each year. Uh, the town of Cape Elizabeth does allow a grace period until May 1st of each year. Uh, at that time, we do um, add on to the regular fee a $4 late fee. This warrant does allow us to do that, and it is a public notice to the fact that the licenses are due January 1st and that we do assess a late fee here in Cape Elizabeth on May 1st. So it is an order to be signed this evening. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Item seven. number 61. To consider a local option liquor referendum oh. question to set to public hearing. No. Michael? Debbie. Debbie. I did receive in my office a petition uh, for a local option referendum question to be on the May 3rd municipal election. Uh, so far, the requirements through the state statute, um, Title 28, have been met. The requirement is that a petition come uh, before the municipal officers, which is 15% of the votes cast in the last gubernatorial election, which would have been November of 86. Uh, that would have been 650 signatures. We do have 705 um, certified signatures by a Board of Registration. I do have that in my office. Uh, the appropriate action at this time is to receive um, or accept the petition uh, and to set to public hearing for the uh, next uh, council meeting, which is on April 11th. At that time, that is the time for any debate questions or what have you from the public and from the council. So at this time, we just need to accept the petition and to put to public hearing for the April 11th council meeting. Time are we up to eight o'clock, Bill? 
No, this is 7.30, so I made room for this one here when I made my own. I'll make a motion that we set this Sunday sale of liquor store to a public hearing on Monday, April 11th, 1988, at 7.30 p.m. at the town hall. And then we accept the petition. And we accept the petition. And I'm not allowed to comment at this point, I think. Second. Well, I meant the motion, <laughs> not you're not commenting. <laughs> well, I just wondered about the procedure. Whenever we receive a petition, we then set a public hearing first before we vote to put that on. In this particular uh, one, this is um, actually a request from the registered voters in the town. It is considered a local option or a referendum question because there is not debatable time at the actual uh, election, which in this case would be in May, the law provides for a public hearing, and so the councillors do have to set that public hearing. The um, Title 28 ex itself says that at a duly called meeting, the officers must set the public hearing, and it's a formality, if you will, on setting the public hearing. Thank you. Yes, there was a motion with second in there. Now, I will oh, not. Any hold further my, discussion? I'll hold my comments. I okay. would just like a point of order here. What are the ramifications of a defeated vote? Of a no vote at the May election? Are we not. But, but ahead of this okay. council voting now. No vote, no. It's irresponsible. Well, why would you be asked to vote if you can't vote no? I no, think this goes back to a question that, that Frank had earlier about referring. I know that's a that's a procedure within the town ordinances, but I don't understand this one at all. Maybe we don't need a vote. Maybe you simply need to set it for public hearing. Well, but I wonder we if... We have to vote on any setting for public hearing. We've done it several times. Mm -hmm. I don't like to be told to vote yes. I mean, I really, I balk at it. You must know for six years I've balked at a few items. Not because they would break the back of the town or anything else, just that philosophically I was opposed. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to vote no on this item just to find out why and what the ramifications are of a no vote. Because I'd like to know. But is it right? I respect the citizens' right to petition, mm -hmm. and I respect their right to get this on the ballot. Mm -hmm. But I resent the fact that we have to vote for something without local control. You vote the ballot. I think it's there. We could have voted against referring the zone change to the planning board. I think we could have. And I think they could have then taken it to court and overturned our vote. But I don't know what they can do if we vote no tonight. And that bothers me. Who's they? The, 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 the citizens? Petitioners. Did you and that, state that's what... Oh, wait, no. you know, I don't mean to law. take up our time. I don't understand. Yeah, I don't understand I, his dilemma. It's a state law. This is the procedure, the way the state has laid it up. If you want to go to the legislature in Augusta and change the law, you can. You have every right to do that. But that's the law as it's, as it's been laid down. Yeah, but they don't say we have to vote yes. No, you don't. Know. Are you fearful that people will misconstrue your vote if you vote yes to set a public hearing? I've never been concerned at all no, about people. No, misconstrue it to mean your support for. What they're after? Oh, no. I've, I've never made it quite clear. I'm never worried about how people screw my vote. I am concerned that we have a, a town ordinance that says zone changes shall be referred through the council. It's a local ordinance. If I don't like that, we'll change it. I have no control over a vote that I'm asked to make tonight because the state says I have to vote a certain way. I don't accept that. My major concern is we're going to break our... It's going to be 61. I'm not going to hurt that. One out of two votes we've taken tonight that is not in the But if you want to spoil our wonderful record, that's okay. Is there any further discussion, Councilor Jordan? Yes, I'd just like to make a comment. I, in a way, in agreement with what Dougie has said, but... I'm not too concerned about sending it to a public hearing, and I think it would be good for the council to have the public hearing and understand what the people have to say about it, and I think it would 
be better in the future. And me, and I'm going to vote in favor of sending this to a public hearing, but I don't want nobody to get the idea that I'm in favor of the issue, because I'm not. Hi, Mr. Jordan. Yeah, just one more question. We send it to public hearing, and then we hear the public, public then we say no to the referendum. What? That's right. You can't. No, I don't no. think you can. You can't huh? say no. You're just setting this to a public hearing, period. Councilor Amaro. We're just giving people a, a forum to speak on it. That's all. It has to go to referendum. We've had a citizen uh, initiative here to send it to referendum. So Council We don't have the prerogative of, of denying the, just a, the citizens that opportunity. Yeah. I, I can't We're just providing a place for people to come and discuss the issue before, the, uh, before they vote on it. That's all. Well, I guess I was going to reiterate what Councilor Amaro said. I can't understand why we were discussing this. This is a citizen initiative. Mm -hmm. And if we were to vote well, no, we'd be denying the forum, the proper yeah. state mandated forum in which we're yeah. discussing issues. So all that's all we're going to do is we're going to provide them, as she said, the First forum. Amendment, right. We have, a, we have a citizen that's been here all night. We ought to let him say something. <laughs> Sir. I think you're obligated to vote you know, to give them a hearing. I think the only question before you is when you do it. And I think that's the only decision you have the right to make. We don't have the right to make that decision. We're told we have to do it. So why vote? Because we have to choose a date. You're, you're only voting. Everything else we said. I think you're only voting to set a date. You're, you're, you're obligated to set a date, period. I think the answer to Councilor Tinsman's question is when you take an oath as a counselor uh, and you, you accept the responsibility of the office, part of that oath is that you'll carry out the laws of the state of Maine and, and the town of Cape Elizabeth. And it's simply in uh, carrying out the obligations of the oath that you took and signed. Okay. If, if I may, if my vote is to determine the date of a public hearing, I can vote for that. Mm -hmm. But I cannot vote because if the only option I have is to vote yes or to vote in the affirmative, then I have no choice and I will vote against it. If it's just to pick a date for an obligated public hearing, I can vote for that. That's what I'm doing. Okay. I suppose, but I... So are you trying to make it unanimous? So we should set a date. <laughs> you, don't know, you don't know what the rest of us are going to do, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, brother. Yeah. Please vote. April 11th. We have a date, April 11th. Motion has been made and seconded. Are you ready to vote? Yes. All those in favor? Come on. Ah, right, all right. <laughs> all right. Why don't you abstain? Conflict of interest. Uh, we now have come to uh, that part of our agenda which provides a citizen discussion of items not on the agenda. Is there anyone? Any citizen here who wishes to address the council? If not, then we're open for agenda. So moved. Second. All those in favor? And good night. <laughs> <laughs> I would uh, like to have the council uh, discuss the manager evaluation and a meeting that we should have on his compensation compensation because two councils were absent uh, at the workshop and uh, we really didn't want to get into a tag, particularly you as chairman of the finance committee, uh, until you were able to participate.